Well, good morning. This is Barry O'Dell with the Church of Christ at Mammoth Spring Facebook page. It is Monday, March 22nd, 2021, and we are working our way through the book of Daniel. Hope everybody's had a good weekend. I see quite a few on the stream already. A couple of comments. Good morning, Lyle and Gail and others who are watching. Hope everybody had a good weekend and are ready to get back to it today. Hey, Mark and Connie, glad to see you guys on here today. We started Daniel chapter 11 last Friday and uh, didn't finish it. There's a lot of content here. I did, however, share some links in that video uh, in the comment section to help you kind of uh, gather some information for yourself. There's a lot more information out there on the events recorded here, or rather prophesied here in Daniel chapter 11. This particular section of Daniel, these last four chapters, 9 through 12, hey Linda, are the most difficult, there's no question about it, section, uh, part of the entire book of Daniel. And uh, when you, you know, the more and more you study it, it's it's interesting. I don't know how many commentaries I've got on Daniel. Uh, I've got five sitting on my desktop right here, and I've got others on my shelves here. Hey, Joni. And David, um, <laughs> there's the one common thing among all these books of Daniel, uh, commentaries on the book of Daniel, is the disagreement uh, on <laughs> on what exactly is being prophesied here in Daniel chapter 11. So we're going to get to it, but let me kind of reframe exactly what we're dealing with here. It really starts back in chapter 10, where Daniel is told by Michael, Daniel 10 and verse 14. Um, or rather not by Michael, but an angel who's communicating with Daniel. Uh, Daniel 10 and verse 14, Daniel's being told what will happen to your people, the Jewish people, in the latter days, for the vision refers to many days yet to come. So obviously this is a looking into the future section of the book of Daniel, which a lot of it is. But the rest of it, you know, prior to chapters 9, 10, 11, and 12, pretty, pretty straightforward, pretty easy to understand. But he wants, uh, Daniel is informed that he's not going to be alive to see these things take place. You then get into chapter 11, and uh, I'll go ahead and start using my, let me get over here to my PowerPoint real quick. You get into chapter 11, and we know what we're talking about, all right? We know because of the text, the first four verses here, we're talking about a history. For Daniel, a future history. For us, looking backwards, a history of Persia, Greece, and Rome. Uh, we, it's just beyond question there. Uh, good morning, David and Brian. Oh, Brian is at the Ark in Kentucky. Well, that's pretty cool. You know, I've always wanted to go there. Maybe we'll have to make a trip there sometime. Good to have you there. Here and there. <laughs> Daniel 11, 1 through 4, we're told that Greece would overtake Persia, but then is divided to the four winds. And we talked about that. That's pretty straightforward. Alexander the Great died at a young age, 32 or 33, after about 10 or 11 years. Um, and when he died, the uh, kingdom of Greece was divided among his four generals. Um, secular history shows us that, but the biblical text even tells us uh, about that as well. Then when you read verses 5 through 35, after that event takes place, again, in Daniel's future, yet in our past, the, the kingdom of Greece divided into four, but the north and the south, the, the east and the west, uh, Macedon and Thrace, they kind of fall by the wayside here in the biblical text. What's focused on is the north, the Syrians or the Seleucid empires, and the south, Egypt and the Ptolemies. And that's what we have from Daniel 11.5 through verse 35. And that's kind of where we are right now. And then we talk about another king in verses 36 through 45, and we will, uh, we will get to that today. And uh, we have to remember this. This is so important in, in grasping what's going on here in these last three or four chapters. Daniel chapters 2, 7, 8, 9, and 11, and 12 all cover from Daniel's day, whether we're talking about Babylon and Nebuchadnezzar or Darius and Persia. They all cover from, all of his visions cover from that day into the days of the Roman Empire. That has to be understood. So you've got the Persians, you've got Darius the Mede here in chapter 11 and verse 1. Three kings that would arise after him, Cambyses, Smyrtus, 
And that Darius, I'm not going to try to pronounce that last name. <laughs> it's too difficult. But then it says you have a fourth king that will be richer than them all. Well, the fourth king after uh, Darius the Mede would be the Ahasuerus of Esther. We know that. I mean, again, secular history testifies to all this. Um, and then you have Greece. Okay, Gail says this has gotten really blurry and you can't read the words. Well, I don't know why. Everything looks good on my end. Could be a thing with fidelity. I don't know. Well, after Persia, you have Greece and you have Alexander the Campbell. <laughs> Alexander the Campbell, what a slip there. Alexander the Great and his kingdom divided into four. Uh, Macedon, Thrace, Syria, and Egypt. And the north and the south are the Syrians and the Egyptians. All right, so that's where we are. That's the context. Uh of where we are here, we're already starting verse 21. Oh, I can't believe I said that. <laughs> uh, Connie says that's good on her computer. All right, that's good to know. Thank you. So we're in verse 21. And um, if you missed the first video on Daniel chapter 11, you really need to go back and watch it and then come back and watch this one later because there's so much going on here. But we're in verse 21. And we're reading about a king who would arise, a vile person to whom they will not give honor or royalty, the honor of royalty, but he shall come in peaceably and seize the kingdom by intrigue. Looking at the progression through history, we know who this refers to. And that is a man by the name of Antiochus IV. Okay. Antiochus Epiphanes. This guy believed that he was a son or a, maybe better put, would be a representative of uh, of uh, Zeus. He thought he was a son of a god. David, I guess you liked my slip, didn't you? <laughs> That's uh first time for everything. Anyway, it says, With the force of a flood, Daniel 11, verse 22, they shall be swept away from before him and be broken, and also the prince, the prince of the covenant. And what he's going to talk about here, or what's going to be revealed to Daniel here, rather, are some things that... Uh, that uh, Antiochus is going to do during his reign. Um, he's going to act deceitfully, verse 23. He wants, he wants the entire kingdom. He doesn't want this north and south business anymore. He wants the whole thing, okay? And that's what he's trying to accomplish here. Um, he's going to enter peaceably, verse 24. He is going to, uh, even into the richest places of the province, and he shall do what his fathers have not done, nor his forefathers. He shall disperse among them that plunder, the plunder, spoil, and riches, and he shall devise his plans against the strongholds, but only for a time. Hey, good morning, Mom. Good to see you on here. Listen to this. He shall stir up his power and his courage against the king of the south, against Egypt. Antiochus would attack Egypt, and we know historically that this took place about... 168 or 167 B.C., somewhere in there. And the king of the south shall be stirred up to battle with a very great and mighty army, but he shall not stand, for they shall devise plans against him. Egypt's going to fight back. You're normally, you're uh, naturally, you're attacked. You're going to defend. Well, he was betrayed by his military, the, the king of Egypt, during all of this. And so he didn't stand. Those who eat of the portion of his delicacy shall destroy him. His army shall be swept away, and many shall fall down slain. Uh, Egypt is divided here. There's a there, there's power struggle going on in Egypt. Antiochus and the Syrians, they're one in control of everything. Uh, both of these kings' hearts, verse 27, shall be bent on evil, and they shall speak lies on the same table. You know, it's interesting as I read this and read that phrase right there in verse 27, politics is no different today. Everybody wants power. They'll come in peaceably. They'll make leagues. They'll lie. They'll be deceptive. It, the world, in, in, a, in a very real sense, societies are not any different today than they were 200 years before the birth of Christ, which is where we are historically here in Daniel chapter 11. They operate the same way. But notice this, verse 27, But it shall not prosper, for the end will still be at the appointed time. And, and that phrase there tells me that God's still in control. The end of what? Well, the end of Antiochus and what he's trying to do. God's going to handle all this. It's just like Belshazzar was told, um, or rather Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel chapter 4, the Most High rules in the kingdoms of men and appoints over them whomever he will. The end will still be 
at the appointed time. God's in control. While returning to his land with great riches, his heart shall be moved against the holy covenant. So, how sh- so, sh- so he shall do damage and return to his own land. When Antiochus went against Egypt to conquer Egypt, the Roman army stepped in. And again, we can see this in history. This is about 167, 168 B.C., somewhere in that period of time. At the appointed time, verse 29, he shall return and go towards the south. Here we are. He's going to try to go against Egypt, but it shall not be like the former or the latter, for ships from Cyprus shall come against him. Therefore he shall be grieved and return in rage against the holy covenant and do damage. So because he couldn't take Egypt, because Rome stepped in, Now he's going to attack Palestine. He's going to attack the Jewish people. And so starting here in Daniel 11 in verse 30 uh, down through verse 35, we read about what he did. And and you can read about this. Again, it's interesting. You can read about this in the writings of Josephus. You can read about this in the writings of the Maccabees and the Apocrypha. There are many historical documents that verify what we're reading here. And remember, when Daniel's, when, when this is being revealed to Daniel, it's about 350 years prior to all the events taking place. All right? Never forget that. So verse 31, or rather verse 30, um, he's going to return against, in rage against the Holy Covenant and do damage. So, shall he, so he shall return and show regard for those who forsake the Holy Covenant. You know, if Jews would, you know, to escape the persecution the difficulties that he was bringing against, Antiochus was bringing against Jerusalem and and Judea in that area, well, he'd show them favor. But not everybody did that. Uh, They're going to defile the sanctuary, and then they shall take away the daily sacrifices and place there the abomination of desolation. Again, you can read about this in uh, 1 Maccabees, about this taking place, where uh, he defiled the temple, And the sacrifices came to an end and things like this. Notice verse 32. But the people who know their God shall be strong and carry out great exploits. There were people who even during that time, Jewish people, where Antiochus IV is attacking, they would still be faithful to God. They would do great exploits. That is, they would stand up. They would fight. All right? And those of the people who understand shall instruct many, yet for many days they shall fall by sword and flame, by captivity and plundering. This is a prophecy of what was going to happen uh, to the Jews during the days of Antiochus IV. Now when they fall, as you know, as the Jews are being persecuted, they shall be aided with a little help, but many shall join with them by intrigue. And some of those of understanding shall fall, some who would not forsake God were going to die. All right, that's what was going to happen. But notice, they're going to be purified. They're going to be made white until the time of the end because it is still for the appointed time. Until the time of the end, what does that mean? Well, the persecution that Antiochus would bring against the Jews would come to an end. That's what it means. That's the historical context. And these people who remained faithful to God would be purified and white that is, they're going to remain faithful. They're going to stay holy and uh, not um, turn away from God in an effort to preserve their own physical lives. Again, until the time of the end, because it is still for the appointed time, God is in control. This vision troubles Daniel because he knows this is all about his people. That's repeated throughout chapters 9, 10, and 11. 9, 10, 11, and 12. What I'm getting ready to tell you, Daniel, affects your people many days in the future. You'll be dead, but you're, you know, you're, you're giving a vision of what's, given a vision of what's going to happen in those days. Well, so Antiochus' days are appointed for an end, verse 35. Now, when we get to verse 36, let me uh, scroll back up here real quick. Click over here. Um... In Antiochus' days, coming to an end, there's another king that's going to come up, and that's where we start reading in verse 36. And I know it sounds as a continuation here, because it says, Then the king shall do according to his own will. But when you read all the way through verse 45, there are things mentioned here that this, that this king does that we know historically, more and more research and reading I've done um, for myself and that many others have done, we know this doesn't refer to Antiochus and what the Syrians did. And remember, 
Daniel chapters 2, 7, 8, 9, 11, and 12 all cover from the days that Daniel was alive until the days of the Roman Empire. So when we start reading here in verse 36 and on into chapter 12, we're reading more, uh, we're reading now about Rome, no longer about Syria versus Egypt. All right, the trans, there's, a, there's a change here. The king shall do according to his own will. He shall exalt and magnify himself above every god, shall speak blasphemies against the god of gods, and shall prosper till the wrath has been accomplished. Notice verse 36, for what has been determined shall be done. Once again, a statement of the fact that God is in control here. And it goes on talking about the way that this king or this kingdom, uh, Rome, would behave itself. Um, you get down to verse 40, at the time of the end, the end of these specific historical events, what we're dealing with here. The king of the south, Egypt, shall attack him, and the king of the north shall come against him like a war, whirlwind. Well, um, Egypt never attacked Antiochus the fourth. Just didn't. Rome did what we're getting ready to read here in verses 40 through 45. We do know that Rome did these things. Antiochus did not. Um... So the king of the north shall come against the king of the south like a whirlwind with chariots, horsemen, with many ships. Uh, he shall enter the countries, overwhelm them, and pass through. He shall enter also the glorious land. Throughout their history, here's what we have to understand too, throughout Israel's history, I mean from the very beginning, they were under assault. You, you think back to the wilderness wanderings. Even as they were in the wilderness, having left Egypt, they were under attack. Well, it continues here. Um, the glorious land here, verse 41, Jerusalem, many countries shall be overthrown, but they shall, but these shall escape from his hand. Edom and Moab and the prominent people of Ammon. He shall stretch out his hand against the countries and the land of Egypt shall not escape. He shall have power over the treasures of gold and silver and over all the precious things of Egypt. Well, again, when you look historically, we know that this is referring to Rome and their, the, the spread of their empire. Uh, also the Libyans and Ethiopians shall follow at his heels, but news from the east and, east and the north shall trouble him. Therefore uh, he shall go out with great fury to destroy and annihilate many. Um, this is that beast, that fourth part of uh, Nebuchadnezzar's vision. Remember the legs and feet of iron, and, uh, the legs of iron and the feet part iron and part clay. This is that great empire that was unlike any other beast or any other part of that image. Uh, very powerful. He shall plant the tents of his palace between the seas, verse 45, and the glorious holy mountain. Yet he shall come to his end and no one will help him. Just like Babylon, just like Persia, uh, just like Greece. Now we read about Rome. He shall come to his end and no one shall help him. Remember, this is for appointed, an appointed time, until the time of the end. Daniel is told a, a lot of bad things are going to happen to your people, but God is in control, and it's going to come to an end. We have to understand that. Kingdoms rise and kingdoms fall. That's, that's been the history of the world. It's still going on today. God is in control. Um, he rules in the kingdoms of men and gives them to whosoever he, whomsoever he will. Daniel four seventeen and 25. This book, perhaps more than any other in all the Bible, illustrates that so well for us, that God is in control. And that he is, I guess as you could say, he and his, like Michael and, and Gabriel and these other spiritual forces that we talked about the other day. Remember, we looked at Ephesians 6 and 2 Corinthians chapter 10 where we're told we don't fight against flesh and blood but against principalities and powers and spiritual darkness in high places. We're in a spiritual warfare. There's a, there, there's a realm that exists outside of this physical realm where we can use our five senses. Now, God's in control of all of it. But there, there is that, um, I guess the best way I would know how to state it is that spiritual realm that exists. Um, and, and we're seeing a lot of that kind of behind-the-scenes activity here throughout the book of Daniel, probably more so in Daniel again than any other book in your Old Testament. So now we're ready for chapter 12, and that's where we will come back tomorrow. And we are, we're through the Syrian and the Egyptian stuff. 
We're still focused. And in fact, I want you to notice this kind of leading up to tomorrow. If you look at Daniel chapter 12 at that time, well, obviously that naturally follows what we've just been reading about. But you read uh, in Daniel 12 and verse 1 twice about your people. In other words, what he's talking about here to Daniel will affect the Jewish people. Um, we read about verse 4 in the time of the end. Well, the time of the end specifically means the things that Daniel was, I don't know if, I guess blessed is the right word to use, privileged, let's use privileged, to see, and things that were revealed to him by this angel. Remember, though, Daniel 12 and verse 5, he's still on a riverbank. Well, that's the Tigris River where Daniel's sitting in captivity. Anyway, I don't want to get too far ahead of myself. We'll get into chapter 12 tomorrow. I don't see any comments or questions. So we will stop here, pick up in chapter 12 tomorrow at 11 o'clock. And um, I don't know if you all saw the post, but we're going to start the book of Romans on Wednesday. That's the plan. We're going to start the book of Romans. I think that'll be a very beneficial study. Romans is a wonderful book to study. All right, guys, I appreciate all of you being on here today. As always, if you have any further questions or comments after the stream is over, the comment section is still available. You can send me a message. Um, if you have somebody who'd like to do these studies, if they don't do Facebook, send them to our YouTube channel. You know how all this works. All right, guys, have a good day, and I hope to see you back here tomorrow at 11 o'clock.